Hey guys, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for coming out on such a, a cool morning. We had a great discussion this morning. Um, I want to introduce Scott Buckwilder and Leslie Hayes. Months and I met with Scott about several things. Uh, back in May, I'm rereading the emails. I couldn't believe it already passed. Time had passed by so fast. And so we were really excited about the things that we discussed and wanted him to come. And this is the opportunity, the first opportunity our schedules aligned where he could be with us to discuss some of the quality improvement work that he's doing. So I greatly appreciate you being here. And I'm going to turn it over to you guys now. Huh? Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Good morning, guys. Um, uh, so Leslie Hayes uh, and I um, helped to develop and run the UAB Medicine Quality Academy, which is a semester-long um, program course, a graduate level, where we dig into the idea of quality improvement and why it's useful in medical care. In fact, why it may be uh, important and necessary for medical care. So we're going to tag team uh, this as we uh, usually do uh, for this. We also do some uh, some other kinds of programs, not quite as in depth for many of the residents. It's required that they, through their GME program, do some of this. So we have a, a half day program for them, and we're involved in a lot of projects uh, in which these ideas of QI um, are useful. Um, and uh, so I want to set the stage by just talking a little bit about the background, where this comes from, and then turn it over to Leslie, who'll dig in to uh, a little bit more into the data. Sound okay to you guys? Okay. Um, so I'm gonna start with something that may not make total sense uh, and may seem tangential at the outset. You guys are familiar with kind of the determinants of health, those things that relate to uh, behavior um, substance abuse, smoking, obesity, all of those kinds of things, uh, as well as genetics, um, which we're working on as a, as a sort of educational system, not quite there yet, uh, but important stuff. Socioeconomic factors, education and uh, level of income and things like that, these things are the things that drive either health outcomes or um, or are the things that impact um, how healthy we are, those kinds of things. And the thing I'll point you to um, is the fact that right down here at 10% is medical care. So um, the things that we all do here in this medical center every day uh, really um, help keep people alive, but we're really dealing with a lot of disease after it's already occurred. Um, if you went to Europe, for example, you would see that they focus a lot of attention on the earlier things, the behavioral things. They have a lot different view than, than we do. But the point I want to make about this is that although uh, this is the case, about 95% of all of the money we spend in this country, $3 trillion a year, on medical care, is spent on that 10% sliver of acute care that we're all involved with here at this medical center. Um, what's even more interesting is that 40% um, of that 95% is quality associated waste. Um, it's money that is spent that doesn't contribute to care, uh, but it's necessary to spend it because of the the inability to understand and manage processes. Um, and in order to find that waste and remove it, we have to actually use tools and methodology or the same thing continues to happen. Does that make sense to you guys? And so, so I started with that because the estimates are by 2030, I think somewhere around there, um, the cost of healthcare and social security, those things together will bankrupt, the, it, it will surpass all of the revenue that the country takes in. Um, it's, it's absolutely true. And so something has to be done about bending this curve of healthcare costs, but it's not going to be done by the ACA or Obamacare or any new plan the Republicans come up with or the Democrats. The care has to be dealt with where we all sit. And that's the importance uh, in one way of quality improvement. So what's the problem? Well, um, Here's one way to look at it, and probably an important way to look at it. 
If you look at systems, some are simple, uh, cause and effect, real easy to understand, one or two steps. Some things are complicated, like the disassembled automobile uh, right there. And perhaps none of us in this room could walk up and put that automobile together and drive away in it. But if we had a big manual with, with detailed steps and we had experts with us to help do that, that could happen. So in a sense, you see it's complicated, but it's still cause and effect. It's linear, if you will. The problem is, in the third panel, which is an ecosystem, a, a tropical rainforest, if you will. And the problem with that complex system is that there are many pieces, many components of that whose relationships we don't understand. And so small changes um, might create huge uh, devastation or huge changes that weren't predictable for a system like that. Here's an example of that in this, in this system. So this is actually just a partial picture of our IT infrastructure. How, how many of you are clinicians or have worked in the system? A few of you. So you've used impact, right? So this is impact right down here um, in Cerner. That's where we live when we're taking care of patients. But you can see that there's a large number of tentacles and attachments throughout the system. And it's more than once, I'm sure, that those of you who've used it have seen that when they make a change in impact uh, that seems good in one sense creates a lot other pro of other problems uh, in a lot of other parts of the system that we then have to go back and fix. The idea is that this is a complex system, like most of the things we do up on the units and in the hospital and clinic. And if we don't understand those things, uh, we really can't predict our outcomes and we can't fix them. So we are embedding uh, care, uh, here's a ventilated patient, into a system that has all of these coupled pieces that we don't know about if we don't understand uh, how to take that process and break it apart and understand the pieces of the process uh, and actually measure it. Um, so a lot of what we do then is complex and therefore it's unpredictable. It's not linear. We got to do something else or we won't be able to change the outcomes of those processes. And in fact, managing those processes and reducing variation related to that complexity, even for simple, simple appearing things like treating pneumonia or prophylaxing for, for a clot on, on, on the floor are examples of that. Now, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. So <clears throat> you all know what sepsis is. So somebody gets infected and gets systemically infected from that source and then gets shock and then ends up in an ICU, right? And we know that there's a bunch of steps, bundles of care, if you will, that we know from the literature need to be done in order for patients to survive. And the one I'm going to focus on is this three-hour bundle. It's actually not three hours anymore. It's actually now one hour. Um, so we're becoming more aggressive. But at three hours, um, you need to give the patient 30 cc's per kilogram of, of crystalloid. You need to give them broad-spectrum antibiotics. You need to get blood cultures. And you need to check a lactate. Okay? Those four things. And if you do that, at three hours, patients survive, have a higher survival rate. Okay? So here's a question. If you took five seasoned, experienced nurses, really good nurses, and you asked the question, how many ways are there for five really good nurses to do those four things? If you do the math, okay, permutations and combinations, the answer is 120. So the idea here is that complexity creates variation. Now, the way those nurses do those four things might not be wrong if you were given this scenario and asked to say, is this reasonable? Does this follow what you might consider to be good guidelines? You, you'd probably say, yeah, that, that looks okay because they're smart, they're well-trained, just like all of us in the room. But the fact that we have so many different choices and ways to do this creates um, a wide variation of the way things happen. And when that happens, there's all sorts of stuff that goes on on a unit that 
you and I can't see when we just walk on the unit. You're doing your job, you think you're taking good care of patients, and all this stuff is running in the background. You can't supervise it. It's hard to develop competencies. The use of supplies is a problem. The way people do procedures is different, and all of that creates difficulty and bad outcomes because there's so much variation. Here's another problem to lay on top of that, and I'm trying to build the idea for why quality improvement's um, important. Um, in this publication in 2003 in the uh, New England Journal, um, the idea was we get it right about half the time. And what I mean by that is that uh, when these folks followed about 7,000 patients with a whole host of really common high volume diagnoses for two years and went to the literature and said, what do we know with prospective randomized controlled trials, um, peer reviewed journals that we need to be doing for these people? How often over that period of time did they get that care? And the answer was about, about half the time. And the idea wasn't because the caregivers, the docs, the nurses, the systems didn't know that was what was supposed to be done. It was because it's hard to take stuff that you know should be done and make it work in a care setting. It's a common sort of scenario for what we face when we see a lot of projects for, for QI. The problem really is variation. And I guess I would tell you the root cause for a lot of our poor outcomes is complexity. But the real problem is that complexity, as we've discussed it, creates variation. And variation almost always produces worse clinical outcomes, higher cost, and more errors. Actually, about 25% uh, of what we do for patients um, is evidence-based. That is, you can go to the literature and you can find evidence in peer-reviewed journals, good, good data that says this is what we do. That means that 75% of the stuff we do every day is, I'm, I'm going to call it opinion. You might argue with, with that. Um, it's educated opinion. We're all really well-trained. Nonetheless, it's not evidence-based. And the problem is just like those nurses in the sepsis example, is that when that's the case, it's sort of the way I was trained. It's where I'm being trained. It's where I work. It's who my attending is. All of those kinds of things. And those choices produce variation. Does that make sense? And the variation is pretty significant and it's a hard problem to fix. Um, you guys know what this is, anybody? What? So prone, patient prone. Yeah, so it's ARDS. So this is actually a patient uh, from the ARDSnet trial from a number of years ago, uh, borrowed it from Brent James at <clears throat> Salt Lake City, which was the, the sort of mothership for this big study. That's a rotating bed because it helps oxygenation as you uh, rotate patients back and forth from prone to, to uh, upright. And you can see the ventilator tubing and the patient hooked up to a ventilator. This study was done um, because it was felt like the mortality, which was really high, 90% at that time, for acute lung injury or ARDS. Uh, we felt like we were killing patients because we were ventilating them with real high tidal volumes. We were giving them 10 or 12 or 14 cc's per kilogram of these huge breaths, and it was creating barotrauma. It was damaging lungs. This study uh, attempted to understand, um, should we be using much smaller tidal volumes, six cc's per kilogram? And if you stood at the bedside, it felt weird because uh, you couldn't really see very well the patient's chest moving. And yet, um, what this study showed us was that six cc's per kilo was the best way to do it. It's survival markedly improved. But here's the point I want to make. In this study, um, as they were doing that, they looked at variables that either the nurse or the resident coming on that morning, walking into the room, looked at the number of variables that had to be uh, 
potentially looked at. And, and the, the average number of variables, which is now covered up by a green box, was about 236 uh, potential variables. How many things do you think you can, you can remember in your working memory when you're trying to deal with a patient or a problem and make a decision? How many do you think? 50? No. 20? A few 20s. 10? Bunch of 10s. 5? Okay, so there's actually literature on this, or I probably wouldn't be asking you that. Um, so it turns out probably around seven things that you can cram into your working memory to actually make a decision. Everything else just sort of hangs out there. And if you don't do something with all of that, if you don't create standard work for all of that, you still have that problem with variation. This study, uh, was important because they created very specific process pieces to this so that the patients could be ventilated exactly the right way. They actually took the nurse and the doctor and even at some point the respiratory therapist out of the equation and in this study they used computerized models to control ventilation minute to minute. Now we don't do that of course but they wanted to prove the, the point. But it is an example of how standardizing a process allows us to focus our attention on the things that really need uh, attention, okay? When they did that, they had about an 80, 85% compliance, uh, which uh, turns out to be pretty standard when you do a lot of these things, and we'll touch on that in just a minute, but survival increased from less than 10% to 50%. It's higher than that now, but it was a really important study, and here's the last point uh, to make about that. This study in critical care medicine was published in 2008. What they did is ask a bunch of critical care specialists like me or Leslie, uh, do you know how you're supposed to ventilate ARDS patients? Yes, six cc's per kilo. Do you do that? 92% said, absolutely, I do that all the time. And then they monitored, they reviewed the data and only 4% of the time did patients actually get uh, six cc's per kilo, right? So, and it wasn't because we didn't know. It was because this common theme of it's not just knowing what to do, but how do you make it work in a care setting? And that's, that's one of the keys here. This is a guideline for treating community-acquired pneumonia. Uh, it's from Intermountain Healthcare, one of our sister institutions. This is page one of three, and it's one of the best uh, sets of guidelines I've ever seen for somebody that shows up in the ED with pneumonia. So a question would be, if you took that right there and we were the staff in the ED and so we have a meeting on Friday and we review this, maybe it's a grand rounds and we say this is how this needs to work, starting Monday morning at eight o'clock, this is what we're gonna use, treat community acquired pneumonia. The question would be, how likely would that be to improve care or, or health care or make things work? Do you see the idea when you try to do that? Um, the answer is it would help some for sure, especially if you didn't already know that data. But the fact of the matter is that um, this is a spaghetti diagram, if you've never seen one of those, but this is what care looks like. Um, and if you're trying to take those guidelines, even though we're all really smart, and stick them into that set of processes of care, it is unlikely to produce good outcomes because variation is going to be huge. You have to break down the processes, get rid of the waste pieces, and redesign it so that it works well for actually putting those guidelines into the flow of work. Does that make sense? And this happens all the time when we go up and look at care delivery processes. Now, one last piece before I uh, turn it over to Leslie, because, uh, and this is treacherous, because you guys are all researchers, so, uh, um, you know, I'm just a dumb critical care guy. But let me, let me set the stage for what we do with something called statistical process control, which is really the basis for quality improvement, okay? So, just like in hypothesis testing, 
when we go study something, when we're trying to improve processes, we sample patient populations, right? We never can get the whole thing. And so we'll take samples of data, in this case, length of stay for heart failure, just an example, doesn't matter what it is. And that data uh, creates a certain distribution pattern, right? And it has certain characteristics like a mean and a measure of spread like standard deviation. Um, and knowing those things uh, is something that we use a lot in uh, quality improvement as well. And here's why. So you'll all recognize this as a normal distribution. And for all the statisticians in the room, and I'm sure there's a lot of them, uh, there's this thing called the empirical rule. And it says if your data is normally distributed, then 99.7% then, um, of your data falls between three standard deviations, right? And so therefore, any data that falls outside of three standard deviations from a probability perspective is highly unlikely to be by chance. And so in quality improvement, we call that special cause uh, variation. And if we can create a way to look at data like that and look at a process like that, we, we can tell what that process is doing. So if you take that picture in the ED and you manage to put it into a process map and understand it, and then look at the data over time, you can tell what's random, how much variation there is, um, and what part isn't random and is special cause variation and where there's a big problem that we need to understand. So if you take, if you take that and you turn it on its side like this, and you end up with a picture in the upper right corner where you have an upper control limit and a lower control limit at three standard deviations. Now you're using that simple concept. And if you track your data over time like that, that's called a control chart. It's the basis for statistical process control. And you can tell what your process is doing. So, so here's a control chart of some process, doesn't matter what it is. Um, this is before and this is after. We've improved a process, we've gotten rid of waste, we've measured stuff. Uh, and here, you see pretty wide variation, right? And you even see a lot of points, a lot of outliers above three standard deviations. Uh, that's not random. That's because there's problems that are occurring that we need to be uh, aware of. Um, after we've reduced that variation by looking at the process, you can see that there's almost no outliers or special cause variation. And I don't care what unit it is or what clinical process you're talking about. If you measure outcomes here versus here, the, the cost will be down, uh, the clinical outcomes will be better, and there will be fewer errors. And it is that picture that we're trying to sort of foster by teaching everybody and using quality improvement across the system. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay, so creating standard work and doing everything the same is, when we can, is critically important. It's not cookbook medicine, it just says for those things that can be done this way, it's far better. And a lot of QI is managing processes with data and making those processes um, standard so that they're able to be integrated into the work that's being done. If you don't do that, it will not happen. Any questions about that right now before we move on? Okay, we'll have time at the end too, so. And I'll just, I'll just use this for a Okay, okay. Um, hey, thanks for inviting us to come. I'm Leslie Hayes. I, I work at Children's Clinically in the pediatric ICU. So also critical care doc uh, and work with Scott and uh, Noah quality improvement, implementing projects and doing some education. So um, what I want to do is pick up these ideas that we've started with and take, bring it home with some examples of what, what exactly does this mean and how would we think about this. And, mm. and I might start by saying, uh, do anybody have ideas about what they think quality improvement is or have definitions of that? 
maybe not something you think about this group thinks about on a daily basis i think if you google quality improvement you'll get a whole bunch of definitions one of the first ones that pops up is um, something that talks about the unceasing efforts of everyone which honestly is pretty exhausting sounding to me um, so i will give you kind of my definition and you can throw it in there with a thousand others that exist so i think uh for something to actually really be quality improvement it must improve outcomes but it has to make your life better too and Hey, hi there. <laughs> Welcome. Can you make sure to mute, please, on the online? Uh, so making outcomes better and has to make your life better. So what does that mean? That means that if we create something, a policy, a procedure, something where you have to go into um, a health stream and sign off that I understand this is the new thing that we're going to be doing, that new policy, procedure, order set, power plan, whatever it is, is not going to consistently produce better outcomes if you have to create workarounds to make it happen. And I think we experience that all the time where someone really smart comes up with a new idea, here's how we're going to do this. Well, if you can already see what the problems are with that and that it won't be implemented well, it will never be sustained. So that's actually not quality improvement. Quality improvement would be when someone hands you a new process and you're like, where has this been? This is making my life so much better today because it's improved the workflow because someone actually asked me what the problem is with this process. So that's quality improvement. So let's talk about how we can solve this problem that we have with complexity and the inappropriate variation. So, um, and I want to clarify that too. Our patients vary. There is variation that our patients demand. Here's the problem. The problem is we are so caught up in all our own inappropriate variation that's based on, uh, in my unit, in the past, every Monday morning, new attending comes on and somehow the plan changes for the patient. The patient becomes completely different every Monday morning and we have to rework everything. That's inappropriate variation. Every attending may be right, just like Scott said, about the way they want to go about it. The problem is you drop it into that spaghetti diagram and you're now asking a whole bunch of people who are floundering in that work environment to try to predict what is this person going to want me to do about this. That's inappropriate variation. When you create standard work, which is the exact opposite of cookbook medicine. Standard work is creating a template where the things you know have to happen will happen. And you don't, it doesn't have to be one of those seven things you remember. It will be automatic. It will be, it will be in there for you like a checklist or some um, process that is built in and embedded in the system so it is easy to do the right thing. Once you do that, that gives you all the freedom to think about how your patient is different and what do you need to do that is special for that patient. And like Scott said, typically 80 to 85% of patients will fit in any good process. That gives you that 15 to 20% of your brain power that you can free up now to figure out what do I need to do differently for this patient. That's a huge difference from walking into the same kind of patient over and over and over again and just starting from scratch and recreating the wheel every time you walk in the door that is not successful so um i obviously won't describe this to y'all y'all could describe this to me better but i do want to spend a little bit of time saying well well how do how does uh research traditional research and quality improvement how do those actually partner together and actually need each other in order to have better outcomes so I hope you can read this slide pretty well. Um, this is a slide I created just kind of saying, how are these things similar and how are they different? So, you know, research, obviously, the idea there is to generate new knowledge. You're going to discover things. You're going to, you're going to um, create alternatives to the way we've already done things that should be better than what we're already doing. If you don't partner that with quality improvement, then you miss the implementation part of things. So quality improvement takes those things we know need to be done and says, how will we do that in our local context? How will we improve the environment where we're trying to deliver this care so that even those patients who wouldn't have qualified for the randomized control trial can benefit from this knowledge? Because quality improvement takes all comers. We don't get to say, ah, you're excluded. 
we have to take everyone who's in this environment and figure out how to deliver the best care. So that's how quality improvement partners with this new knowledge you're, genera you're generating. Um, in, uh, so along with that, while in a randomized controlled trial, you have this very tightly controlled environment where you were testing one thing or, or a bundle of things. In quality improvement, we allow whatever's happening in the background to happen. So you could argue, well, how do you know that what you did made it better? And I guess my answer would be, I actually don't really care if I, if I made it better, that's my goal. My goal is to make the care better, to make the outcomes better. And if I can't prove there wasn't something else in the background that was changing that contributed, I'm okay with that. Because my whole goal is to implement the best process and the best outcomes possible for my patients. Um, we do use uh, statistics. So you saw how we take uh, that uh, data distribution, turn it on its side, and actually instead of looking at the aggregate data, we track it data point to data point and see how that varies. That becomes extremely important. Um, the data sizes we use are much smaller. We do not do power calculations. Uh, we 20 to 30 data points. We have 100 years uh, experience that says that's, that's actually about what we need if we have an unbiased sample. So we're working with smaller data points. We're also working in a smaller time frame. We're talking about a quality improvement project when done well is implemented within four to six months and then you see an improvement. So very different timeline. I think both of, both of these fields have to partner together in order to deliver the best outcomes. So here's an example. Uh, so this is um, a study on um, uh, sepsis and orthopedic trauma and looking at the percent sepsis in a patient population. And you can see uh, pretty easily here that I'm going to see if I can use this thing. Yeah. So here, 2016, here's our baseline data, 5%. Sepsis, we'd have to probably look in the literature and say, is this good, is this bad? Uh, but obviously it's not zero, so maybe we can make that better. So someone designs a randomized control trial and implements it, and then we look at the data, the aggregate data, in that next year. It's 20% better, isn't it? Now we've gone down to 4%. So we would argue this, whatever they did, this would be the thing we would want to implement. Now, the quality improvement person in me, and if you're already thinking about what I've said about aggregate data and turning it on its side and tracking it minute to minute, you would say, well, I wonder what this looks like if I actually tracked, tracked it month to month, let's say. So here's that data. So it turns out um, that here's that first year, and turns out the average there is 5%. And here's where we began the trial. And there's the data after. It's better, right? So we would want to do this, wouldn't we? Not really, yeah? So what I, the question I would ask is, who, who fixed things up here that made this better? And why did we tamper with it? And can we hire back all the people who've left in the meantime because they're frustrated? Because whatever they were doing was good. Now, my point here is not that this is what's behind every randomized control trial, obviously. My point here is that aggregate data can be misleading if you're not looking at the variation over time. Now, the reason I'm not showing this graph in a control chart with an average and three standard deviations with that upper and lower control limit is because the entire process is special cause variation. And so those those uh, the standard deviations would look really strange here because everything is special cause. It's just all trending down in a good way before we tampered with it and then it's all trending back up. So that's why I've shown this in just a time series. So just data points over time with no central tendency. So getting back to this slide that Scott talked about, this is the issue um, is that just to put these numbers in there. So if 25% of what we do as evidence, we get that right about half the time. That means, you know, about 86% of the time, we've got inappropriate variation, potentially. This is calling out for creating standard work. Questions about that? I'm gonna go into some examples. Um, this is that picture that Scott showed earlier of the complexity that we work in. So real life, the real world, taking care of patients at UAB, at Children's, wherever you work is a pretty messy business. It's very complex. 
Um, it can be very frustrating. Uh, I don't know anyone who works out taking care of patients. Do you ever have a day where you're like, this drives me crazy? Uh, this could be so much easier. Why is this so difficult? I just want to get through my day. It happens frequently because of the complexity, part of which is due to our patients, but a lot of which is due to the way we're dealing with them. So in quality improvement, what we're trying to do is say, uh, like the example of sepsis and that three hour bundle and five nurses doing four things, all of those options, we wanna narrow that down and say, can we agree that we're gonna make some care decision and instead of letting everyone do it, what, they're, what they wanna do and how they wanna do it and drop all of that onto that spaghetti diagram of a process, we want to create this where we say, let's all agree that for the most part, and again, 80 to 85% of the patients will fit in there. We're all going to agree this is how we will approach that. So we will do it all the same way using data. And by data, I mean actual data points we can look at and process mapping, which is the key to discovering the leverage points in your data. And then we're going to create this predictable process based on our understanding of what's actually happening at the point of care delivery, and that will always improve outcomes. How do you, question, how, yeah. how do you know what the standard of care should be? If 85% if of it is basically expert opinion, how do you decide what should be standard of care? How do you know it's not gonna make it worse instead of better? That's a great question. So uh, what happens is, so, uh, and I, for anyone online who might not have heard that question, the question is, well, if 85% of what we're doing is just opinion, then how do we know that the standard work we create is actually gonna make things better? So let's take the example of no standard work. 85% of what we're doing is still opinion, but we have 100 different opinions in the same context. If you take those 100 different opinions, get people in the room and say, what can we agree on are the goals we have here and how might we gain consensus about one way to do it? And we implement that one way. I have, when that is done well, I have never seen that make things worse uh, because what you're doing is taking the ideas from all of those people, really smart, well-trained, some thoughtful expert opinion, in the background and you deliver that same care, even if it's just opinion, deliver it in one way, then everyone who's providing care knows exactly what needs to be done, it's done consistently, and it will always improve outcomes. Will you have chosen the very best way to approach it the first time? That may be um, even the next question. Maybe not. And that's why you continue to track your data. You track it over time because you need to know, well, you will make it better when you create standard work, but is it as good as it can get? Probably not. And so that's when now you have this standard framework that you can look at and say, we're doing this reliably, and it becomes a little more predictable. And now you can say, now we know exactly what we're tracking because we're doing it every time this way. What are some leverage points? What are things that aren't working? How would we investigate further? Thank you for the clarification. Given the example you showed, though, how would you know that what you've done wasn't really the result of a temporal change. You showed a very nice example with the time series of things getting better on their own. But without a control group, how would you know that your new standard of care actually led to the improvement versus just a temporal change that might have occurred on its own? Good question also. So um, this actually happened because of an intervention that nobody knew was happening. So it was an intervention that a group of people who were delivering the care had made, but they were just doing it on their own, standardizing, and were watching the improvement. So it was happening slowly over time, as you will often see in quality improvement. Now, can we prove that there wasn't some other thing that was just randomly happening? The patient population changed. You have to control for all of those things um, to really be able to say, if you really want to say, this made that better. Um, one thing we can say for sure here is the intervention we did was not helpful. So you can't always prove 100%. Maybe if I show a couple examples, um, maybe that'll help clarify also. Going back to this idea that Scott talked about where 40% of the dollars we're spending in healthcare are going to waste. So that's last year we spent $3 trillion. So that's $1.2 trillion that we're wasting on bad processes. 
um, repeating tests that don't need to be repeated, but we can't find the CT from the outside hospital. Sending labs just because we'd like to see uh, another CDC, those sorts of things. Um, the really, uh, you're all probably familiar with the idea that back in January, there was a $50 million budget cut. And the predominant way that occurred was by line items. So that's things we're not purchasing, uh, that's people we're not hiring, things like that. You can only make those cuts for so long before what you need to do is get in the middle of these processes where we're delivering this inappropriate variation and these poor outcomes that result from that. We've got to get in there, the people who are doing the work and solve those problems in order to actually um, improve that cost profile. So I'm going to take this back to SAPSIS and show you an example of creating standard work with nothing else that happened in the background um, and see if I can um, bring me along on this journey of how quality improvement might work. Uh, going back to around the time when this article that said we only get things right about half the time, also around the time the first IO Institute of Medicine report started coming out, crossing the quality chasm to air as human, this uh, paper about how we deliver care in sepsis came out. Now, there have been a few changes along the way, but the basics of what we need to do for sepsis, we've known it for about two decades now. We know we need to get fluids. We know we need to get antibiotics in quickly. There's some lab tests you need to do. You need to measure some feedback from the patient to know that your interventions are helping. So if that's true, and we've known this for almost two decades, why did we have to implement code sepsis? At UAB, why don't we already know how to do? We know what to do. Why are we having to create a new system? So, at, at a great cost, leading cause of mortality in the inpatient setting across all diagnoses, um, extremely high cost burden to the health system. Really doesn't make sense, does it? Because it, it seems pretty simple. We know what to do. But you remember that spaghetti diagram that Scott showed you? We're trying to implement what? into that context without mapping out how do we improve that workflow. So this is looking at observed to expected mortality in sepsis. Do I need to explain observed to expected to anyone in here? I'll just say really briefly, uh, just in case I don't know um, the, what everyone knows. Uh, so observed is obviously how many patients die. Expected is how many would you predict to die based on the severity of illness model you're using. And so ideally you want this to be one, so everyone who's supposed to die dies, or less than one, meaning you're saving some lives of people who were predicted to die. So looking at this data, and this is real data from one ICU, uh, the uh, observed to expected mortality on average is 1.2. So 20% more patients are dying than should die. This is a problem, this is a very real problem. And this is a control chart like the control chart Scott showed you. So across the x-axis, we've got we're looking at data in quarters. So each of these represents a, a subgrouping of a quarter's worth of data. And looking up the y-axis, we're looking at that ratio of observed to expected mortality. That green line, that's the central tendency, that's the mean, which is what we use in uh, um, a control chart, and then those red lines are the upper and lower control limits, which are three standard deviations around the mean. So that gray line is that benchmark, that's that goal. We want to get to one or below. In this unit, they're almost never there. Now in this unit, you go and you hand out a test. What do we need to do in sepsis and when does it need to happen? There is nobody in this unit who doesn't get 100% on that test. Everybody knows exactly what to do. So why isn't it happening? Here's an example, if you don't know, if you're not looking at your data, you don't actually know what you're doing, kind of gets at that data Scott was showing about the physicians in the ARDSnet trial saying, do you know how to ventilate patients and do you do that? Well, yes, of course I do that all the time. And then you audit the data and it's not quite as good. So here, if we're gonna argue that measuring effective oxygen delivery is important and if we're trying to reverse shock, and this is a Pareto chart, so this is looking at categorical data, and it prioritizes the most common uh, category on the left. So this is a common tool we use uh, in uh, quality improvement. Uh, the most common category is that we didn't measure it. So 70% of the time in the first three hours, we haven't even looked 
at this. So we're doing a lot of interventions. How do we know we're making anything better? Hard to know if we're not looking. And then the, by far, the smaller are that we looked and either are at goal or not at goal. So the idea is, if we're not even measuring this, what is it we're responding to? And do we even know this data? And we don't know this data, because every time we walk in the room to take care of a patient with sepsis, we're just recreating the wheel. We're just starting from scratch. Brand new patient, let's figure out what we need to do. It's all in my head, and then I'll implement it. There's another way to look at a parade, just another example of a Pareto chart. This is looking at where did the patients who went to that unit, where did they come from, where they got referred. How is this helpful? This helps us because we can say, well, gosh, the bulk of our patients in this case are coming from the emergency department. If we're going to pilot somewhere, that may be the place we want to pilot a new process. <coughs> is, is there an issue with, with uh, communication from the ED to that ICU? Do we need to look there? So that spaghetti diagram Scott showed you is a kind of a process map that shows the movement of people trying to accomplish tasks. This is a detailed process map, and this is actually the detailed process map for that unit when a patient is admitted with sepsis. Patient's admitted with sepsis, and this is a 12-hour time frame, and sadly it ends with patient may or may not still be in shock, uh, if you're not familiar with a detailed process map, a rectangle is a step in the process. So every rectangle, that's a step. We, I need to do this, I move on and do this. Diamonds are where you have to stop and ask a question. The more diamonds you have, the more chaotic your process is. What do we think about this process? Is this a good one? <laughs> is it any wonder that we're producing results with an ODE that's far worse than we want it to be. Because everyone's just in there scrambling, asking questions, well, who's putting this order in? Well, did we do this? I don't know, did we do this? Where's this? Do we need a central line? What's happening? Uh, you can just, you can picture, you've probably clinically been in a scenario like this where it just feels like who's in charge? What are we doing? What's the plan? Meanwhile, the resident's putting in 25 orders that all hit the nurse at once, so she's got all these things. What order do you want me to do that in? I'll just do them in whatever order I decide. There we get into that, that big variation. So what do we do? We mapped out that process. There were clearly tons of leverage points for ways we can improve this process. Not, not all these things have to be questions. We can create standard work around that. Here's what that process looks like now for that unit. So they're admitted, we know exactly what we need to do right on admission. We've got goals of management that are posted up in the room. So the nurses know, respiratory therapists know, the residents know, everyone's on the same page. It's really clear what our goals are. We're not guessing about what our goals are. And here's what we do in hour one, and it's in this order. Now, I'll point out here, uh, number eight, do not weigh the patient in the first 12 hours. That may seem really unusual. At UAB, all the beds weigh patients. In this ICU, in this hospital, they do not have beds that weigh patients. And it turned out, when we mapped the process, one of the biggest delays in delivering care was that they were putting the patients up in a sling to weigh them when they arrived. It took at least 30 minutes with a septic patient who people are trying to manage while they're getting this patient up in a sling. So, for this unit, this is how local context is so important. We needed to be explicit. Guess at the weight, use the weight someone else, they came from somewhere else, use that weight, weigh them later when they're more stable and we've gotten out of that first hour or beyond. And so can you see how this process is so much more linear than that other process? And now I'll show you the outcomes. Nobody was taught how to take care of sepsis. Nobody was re-educated. We didn't have a policy that everyone had to sign. We didn't do a, you know, a health stream module where you had to say, here are the elements about how we take care of someone with sepsis. No training. Everybody knew what to do. We improved the workflow. So it's that making outcomes better, making your life better. Improve the workflow so everybody knew immediately what needed to be done in what order for these patients. And now the ODE is 0.6.
pretty neat. And this is really impactful. This is, this is actually saving lives just by making it easier to know how to do what you know you need to do. So, questions about that? How am I on time? Okay, um, so I'll walk through one more. This is again this idea of we know what to do, quality improvement can help you know how to do it. So this is a recent study on looking at improving um, antibiotic delivery time, again, in um, fever and neutropenia, so in uh, cancer patients. And there's a lot that's known in the literature. This is just a sampling of what's known in some of those studies. We know what needs to happen. This is not like community-acquired pneumonia, where we have four hours to get some antibiotics in. This is not like the old sepsis bundle, where you have three hours. That's now with the surviving sepsis campaign. That's now one hour. But in neutropenia and fever, we know that if we don't get the antibiotics in within the first hour, the odds of mortality go up dramatically. So how would we approach this? The common way to approach it would be to use something like Scott showed you. So say uh, for community acquired pneumonia, that really nice algorithm, really detailed. You can't stand at the bedside and go, oh, okay, let me implement this right now on the fly with a really sick patient, but it's great knowledge. So we'd implement a guideline like that. That's typically the first step. So that's what they did. It actually made a really big improvement in this emergency department because prior to implementation, so this is another control chart. These data points here are the baseline data where you can see the average is just slightly above 0% of the time the patient is getting the antibiotics within one hour. And so everything after the blue dotted line is after the guidelines were implemented. Everyone was provided with the guidelines and an order set was made available within, or a power plan was made available within the electronic health system, the health record. And what you will typically see, you see it takes a while for adoption, and then the data points move up, there's still a lot of variation, but gosh, we've gotten to almost 50%. That's a huge improvement, but it's not where we need to go. But you will see this over and over and over again. If we take what we need to do and provide it in the form of a guideline, maybe plus an order set, you're gonna to get to about 50%. You will not get much above that with just those steps. What you've got to do in addition is go and map out the process, understand the workflow issues, and actually improve that workflow. When you do that, then you get up to that 80% or so. And we see this over and over and over again. And so you can get partway there with the what, but you can't get all the way there without the how. Does that make sense? And I think that's where quality improvement and the ways that we look at things and think about things and, and work at the bedside with people delivering the care can partner with the knowledge that's generated um, from traditional research. And again, it's looking at steps in the process and looking at where can we make improvements. So here, this is looking at, they mapped out all of the steps, just a couple examples here, time the patients in the room to the time the antibiotics order. Shorten that time. So we're not going to weigh at time in every step, making it better. Time from the order place to the antibiotic received. Again, decreasing that time. All these things are systematically working to get us within our goal. Questions, discussion? One of my favorite books in the world is The Checklist Manifesto, and it's actually a really gripping, fun QI read. Yes, it is. Um, and in it, one of the central themes is that the person who wrote it is a surgeon. Surgeons think of themselves kind of as artists. Every patient is different, every situation mm -hmm. is different. Where he used more like an airline safety model, yeah. where there's a checklist that you go through to make sure this was making sure they got their antibiotic wash at the right time and get an antibiotic mm -hmm. prior to surgery. So my question is, one of the things that he found really worked was empowering the whole team. So it's not just the person at the top, but it's everyone around them was able to make a check on the other to say, this hasn't happened at the right time. Do you find that that is something that happens again and again, where it needs to filter all the way down the team and they need to be empowered to make change also? Absolutely. So quality improvement is by definition a team sport. It is not an individual saying, I know what this process needs to be, 
I know what we need to do because I'm really smart. I train here at UAB. I'm a product of UAB. So I've got to be really smart. I must know what I'm doing. I haven't gotten fired yet. So let me decide what we're going to do. Uh, that will never work in this kind of care delivery. It has got to be hearing equally from everyone who touches the process or that whatever that care delivery issue is. As an example, so with that sepsis algorithm uh, that I showed you, that big messy one that you know, no wonder the outcomes weren't great. And then all we did was saying, what do we need to do? Let's look at the literature, let's put it into the local context. How can we make that work with the workflow within this unit? Those, all those decisions were made with the nurses and the respiratory therapists and the unit clerks and everybody within that unit uh, who take care of those patients. And I will tell you an example of empowering is when a patient is coming to that unit now who has sepsis, they know they're coming, everybody, the nurse, the rep, everybody's running for this algorithm to put it up in the room because everybody knows how well it works. That's when you know you've done something well. When people feel empowered, they're not gonna wait for the attending to say, aha, this is a patient with sepsis. We will now use the pathway. They're going and getting it and they're doing it. So yeah, 100%, it has that you have to level that playing field. And there are some tools that UAV is going to try to more uh, fully adopt like team steps. Uh, which is a specific program that works on how do we work in teams? How do we communicate with each, with each other? How do we break down barriers? How do you speak up and question me about something? If you see me about to do something that's not right, I sure hope you're gonna tell me. Because if you don't tell, I'm not intending to do it. I would like, I would like that advice from you. Well, Leslie and Scott, thank you very much. This is really a terrific overview of quality improvement, very engaging and very clear. Uh, so a number of us in the room um, are in sort of the implementation science area. We do RCTs of process and mm -hmm. improvements that look in a much more directed way. You know, as I think your one really nice slide of comparing sort of the research approach with the QI approach demonstrated is something that's that's more focused and more targeted. And so the, the common sort of critique, if you will, of QI is is in that slide to some degree. One is the generalizability. You know, so if you do this tremendous thing at UAB that it improves the uh, the outcomes of sepsis, is that translatable to uh, St. Vincent's? Can, you know, can they apply it there? The other critique is, is it cost effective? If you throw enough time and money at a problem, inevitably you can fix it. There's no doubt about that, and that's been shown in PDSA and industry and other approaches. So how would you counter those two critiques, or is it really a a timetable thing where you first do the implementation science to see if something works and then to scale it up, you might do QI later. Are they complementary in that way? Help, help us understand so I, that Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So um, the answer is yes. These sorts of, like the implementation of the sepsis pathway, yes, that's generalizable. With the caveat that every unit may have a different workflow and there may be some things, for instance, if I'm gonna implement that in a unit where they push a button on the bed to weigh the patient, I don't need number eight. That was important to this unit. So, but probably again, the bulk of those things are important and would be implemented almost exactly the same way, but there may be a few things that are different. So generalizable, but needs to be customized a bit uh, for the different unit or the different patient population. So that's one. Financial, um, so return on investment is a huge part of quality improvement. Um, so yeah, we always start with pilots because the last thing we want to do is some big, let's just roll this out and see how it goes. That's not quality improvement. We are going to test it. We may test it in several places before we can feel certain. And we always test it on paper before we commit it to the electronic record again because you will learn from those small tests of change. And if you don't, it's again, not, not really quality improvement. But um, partnering with operations and finance ahead of time, um, very important. When you improve outcomes and reduce the waste in the system, you will have a positive financial impact. Except in the case where in our changing reimbursement structure, we do have to say, there are times where we still get paid for the things we do, even if they're not good things. So we do have to keep that in mind. We're, we're going toward full capitation. We're gonna get there. But while we're in that gray zone, if you're making a big improvement in an area where you're gonna reduce length of stay, 
reduce the cost of taking care of that patient, but from a business standpoint, they're profiting off all those bad things and the too long length of stay, you better partner with the finance people before you put that in place. Because what we would say is, don't hold back on that improvement, but partner with finance, partner with operations and say, are you about to um, leverage some contracts with payers? So you can use that and say, we would like to use this as, let's have some, let's have some shared savings. We're gonna reduce the cost it'll take to take care of this patient, but how about we share in that savings? So Blue Cross, you get this percent, and for every reduction we make, we get this percent. So those are the ways we would partner um, in those special circumstances. But um, if it costs more money, again, really probably not quality improvement. It really does reduce waste and thereby reduces cost. Scott, do you? Well, I would, I would actually go back to, the, to your point about, do, do you guys know the name Atul Gawande? That's the, that's the yeah. surgeon from Boston that wrote the checklist manifesto. Um, if, you, uh, if you haven't done this, it, it'd probably be worth your while. Just, just go to YouTube and type in Atul Gawande and, and listen to one or two of his little mm -hmm. talks or lectures. It's, it, he's a remarkable thinker. Um, yeah. I always think, uh, Ken, about the, the idea that with with research, with carefully controlled uh, populations and data, you're trying to prove um, statistically new knowledge. He talks about, for example, you know that you need to give antibiotics pre-op with, within that uh, uh, time frame immediately prior to cutting. If you give it two minutes after you make the cut, it doesn't prevent infections. So that new knowledge uh, was generated with hypothesis driven testing. Now how do you implement that? Um, when we implemented a checklist in the MICU here, I, I remember well the very first week that we did it. Um, and most of us, like most everybody that does that, scoffed at it a little bit because I'm, I'm a pretty well trained critical care guy, I don't forget stuff like that. Well, by gosh, I mean, a week didn't go by then and almost a week doesn't go by now that we don't find something that we forgot. It's already been proven with level one research, but, but you can't see me forget it, I just do. And it doesn't happen. And his point about using a checklist is really using data to implement hypothesis drip things that have been proven to be effective for that population. Now, how do we make sure with that team that all of those pieces of that surgical procedure that we know improve outcome are actually implemented sequentially and in the right way? And I'm going to just tell you what, what's interesting is that when the World Health Organization went to Atul Gawande and said, this is pretty cool stuff, this, this, this surgical checklist, but does it really work in anywhere? And they did a big study where they tested it at the University of Washington, which had great results already. And they tested it in small hospitals in this country. They tested it in a small hospital in Tanzania which had nothing like what we have in our ORs. And you know what the interesting thing was is that when they used a standard work process and implemented that process in their environment, what was interesting is that in every single institution, and there were eight of them, maybe seven or eight institutions, every single institution, large, small, third world, United States, the surgical mort post-op mortality went down by exactly the same amount, 39 to 40%. Didn't matter if it was Washington or Tanzania, you got the same impact because they took what was proven and made it work in their environment by measuring it and using data. And by the way, one more comment. Um, it, as Leslie pointed out, it didn't work uh, for example, the very first time they did it, 
right? Uh, they got it sort of right. And then they tried it again by, by looking at the data for compliance and how it worked and re-implemented it with those changes and maybe a third time. And, and as they did that, and I guess you would say those are PDSA cycles maybe, but uh, they eventually got to that point and then followed the data and had a dramatic improvement in mortality by taking the what to do proven by level one prospective randomized controlled data and then saying that's what to do how do we make this work with the team and sequentially in our own environment and i guarantee you the or in tanzania looked different than the or at the university of washington but you got the same results interestingly does that make sense uh, it, and we see the same process over and over again in our units whether it's the or the ed the floor an ICU, there's almost never a time that you don't go look at a process where we know what the literature says, but remember we get it right half the time. When we really look at that with process mapping and measure the data that those processes are producing, and there's almost never a time that we can't improve it if we use a team and seek those leverage points uh, with the expertise in the, in the room. So it's really almost a, a it's complementary to level one research. It's, I, I hear where you're coming from, and this is probably beyond the scope of, of today, but what's the difference between implementation research and, and QI? Because I almost see them as, as overlapping, and that would be a fun thing for us to, yeah. to discuss. You buy the beers and we'll. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. you know, the other thing I'll add to that is, this doesn't work just with level one evidence. So this works with that idea of there are some good opinions out there. How do we begin to standardize? Uh, so because again, the majority of what we do does not have level one evidence, and we still have to apply these same techniques, and you still see the same outcomes. Yeah.